Uh, well, hey, everybody, I want to welcome uh, all of our locations downtown. Special shout out to East and then everybody online and TV. So excited that you are here. We are wrapping up our series, Asking for a Friend. And so I want to actually just take a little time to start this off because this, um, this month feels a little crazy. Uh, I don't know if any of you are feeling it. I have felt it. We've got graduation going on. So all the graduates, congratulations. You did it. You survived. Well done. Um, and then, um, yeah, if you want to clap for them. They will be clapped for many times. It'll be great. Um, and then uh, wedding season is starting. Like, I did a wedding last night. And so, and then it seems like school uh, is changing. This, you know, we just got done with school, so there's a transition happening there. So it just felt busy. So everything that you kind of had planned for May, maybe you felt like me. I saw this meme, and I was like, yeah, this feels like May on some levels. <laughs> yeah, like, it's like, I, I didn't try to. I didn't try to save everything for the last minute. But man, and this probably describes my house right there. That's... It's a mess, okay? Um, but some of you who graduated, you're like senior year. Yeah, I barely made it, but we did it. Um, and so there's just these times, seasons in life where we just go, man, things are chaotic. And hear me, some of us thrive under that pressure. Like, yeah, I love it. Other of us are like, be more intentional. Get better. Um, and here's the danger with this, though. This is helpful in some areas. We can navigate life with this. What becomes dangerous is when we do this with our relationships or our own health. Because here's what I found out. This is just crazy to me. It's like when we first start getting that indicator that maybe we even talked about mental health last week, like, but any kind of health indicator that's like, hey, something's off, we will wait two and a half years to six years before seeking any help. That's a long time. And then you apply that to relationships, specifically even marriage, same data. We will wait two and a half years, six years. And even my role here, I do a lot of counseling. Uh, I do a lot of weddings. And so I got premarital counseling, marital counseling. And that is usually the case. Couples come in and it's like, yeah, we're hoping you can save our marriage. And I'm like, oh, it would have been great to meet with you like three years ago and begin navigating some of this. Because here's the question I want us to wrestle with today. Is what should I do about my marriage? Now, some of you are just like, ah, oh, I showed up for the wrong week. Um, <laughs> I get it. Because there's a lot of feelings when it comes to this. Some of us are like, don't want to talk about it. It's been a tough situation. It's, it sucks, okay? Some of us are single and going, not thinking about it right now. Okay, here's the truth, though. Marriage affects all of us. And I know we hear that, but I also, as we go through this sermon today, I want you to hear a lot of the things that we're going to talk about relationally applies to your own individual health. Because marriage is ultimately this test, learning how to love somebody. Through all the obstacles of life, learning how to love someone. That's the challenge, and it's a beautiful challenge that God gives us when he gives us this gift of marriage. He goes, I want to teach you how to unconditionally love someone. But man, there's a lot of hard pieces with that. And so as we navigate today, I hope that you will not tune me out, because I think a lot of this will apply because I think all of us are answering somewhat of this question. Some of it is, you are married and you're like, my marriage is okay, but how do I make it better? Some of us are saying, my marriage is broken. I don't know how to fix it. Some of us have a lot of friends coming to us. Maybe you are single and you're not like, I don't want to get married. Uh, but they're coming to you and, and they're going, telling all their issues or telling all about their marriage. And you would love to give maybe some advice, but you don't even know where to start. And some of us were sons and daughters of watching our parents' marriage, and we're like, ugh, that's not awesome. And so I think this conversation helps us go, and this applies even to family, it applies to friendship. How do we be healthy individuals and learn to love someone, especially in the context of marriage? Because what we're learning is how to have intimacy, how to love somebody. So I think Jesus speaks to this. He, shared this uh, in Matthew. He said, have you ever read the scriptures? Jesus replied. They record from the beginning, God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And two are united into one. 
Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. The part I want you to focus on is that two are united into one. Speaks to this intimacy of learning how two people can become to this beautiful picture of one. And it speaks to also God created us in his image. God is also one but also three beings. He wants us to experience community like he has. Where the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have this beautiful dynamic that we go, that's God. And he goes, marriage, I want to have you guys experience the same thing to where not only is our relationship healthy here, but you learned to have a healthy relationship here as well and experience the uh, intimacy that, think about it, it's the only place where God goes, hey, I, I have some rules for this one. Doesn't do it with friendship, doesn't do it with family, but he makes it very clear, marriages, here are some rules. And I think these rules are very valuable across a lot of different relationships too. So here's, if we're gonna talk about intimacy, here's the three areas we need to focus on. Emotional, physical, and spiritual. And so Jesus, uh, even later on, is, and scriptures are talking to God. He's praying to the Father. And he describes intimacy. I think we need to make sure that we have um, the correct definition. So here's Webster's Dictionary, and then I'll show you kind of the passage that Jesus gave that gives us even a stronger definition to it. Close familiarity or friendship, closeness. I think all of us go, yep. Kind of thought that might be the, <laughs> be the answer to that one. Um, but Jesus takes it a little bit step further when he's praying and he's going, here's the intimacy I want humanity to experience with God. And he's praying this. And think about it, just experience his prayer over us. He said this in John 17, verse 3, and this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. So the part that I want you to connect is to know you. If you were to study that by definition, to look it up, that is Intimacy. You'll see it throughout the Bible in a lot of different ways. Uh, Described they knew each other, sometimes referencing to family or friendship. There was an intimacy there. They refer to it in marriage as like they know each other, if you know what I mean. And so there was that kind of context as well. And then Jesus brings up the spiritual part of the going, hey, I want to know you. I want to know you on a very intimate level. And so the other part I want you to recognize is the eternal life here. Because it's great to know somebody, but if you don't like them, spending the rest of your life with them sounds miserable, right? No? No one else thinks that? Okay, okay. I was just, because that's that's the danger in this, because Jesus is going, I'm not just talking about time. I'm talking about quality of life, to where when we get to spend eternity with him, he goes, it's going to be great, and we're going to have an awesome relationship. We're going to work through things together, and we need to build this intimacy. Now, time is a portion of that because he wants it to be forever. But then take this and go, Jesus goes, so I want you to experience that with me, but I also want you to experience it with other people to where you can have intimacy with your family for forever, intimacy with your friends for forever, and intimacy with your spouse for forever. It's a beautiful thing that God goes, I want you to feel valued, heard, seen. That's why intimacy matters. And so we'll start with this first one, emotional intimacy. Now this one, I think, if you were going to like sum it up, it goes, this all has to do with value. To where you feel um, understood, you feel heard. Once again, you feel seen. And so to describe it, it's a closeness defined by the extent of trust and communication. This gets into how we talk to each other, how we deal with fights together, how we just navigate life together. And I think the scriptures give a beautiful picture of this, of kind of what is the environment that would be healthy for that? How do we know if our emotional health is healthy? If our emotional intimacy is where we need it to be. Uh, Ephesians 4 says this, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. So here's a challenging question that I would like you to ask your spouse at some point. And go, hey, is that the environment we have within our marriage? Are we humble towards each other? Are we gentle towards each other? Are we patient with each other? Now, you may not be perfect in all these areas, 
But the goal is to strive for that. To where we create this gift that we're able to offer someone and go, hey, I want you to experience this. I want you to know this. I want you to feel valued and to feel heard. And I would encourage you, all of us, during this time, as I walk through these three, take notes, ask these questions because I think it's so vital because sometimes we may be communicating, but sometimes somebody asks a better question and you're like, man, that opened up a whole nother door for us into our relationship. And so with this one, when it comes to emotional health, you've got to look at the environment you're creating. And I've kind of gone like, yes, I could show you like, hey, here's how I do it. But sometimes I learn the best by going, here's not how to do it. And so here are some warning signs of just when you've got emotional health or emotional intimacy, is it healthy or not? First thing is this, can't express what you need. Now, this plays out in all relationships. Think about in family or friendships. It's like, I can't express what I need in this relationship. So what does that create? It creates distance. There's not an emotional connection. And so I think there's two factors that kind of happen in this, especially within marriage, is one, the person who's trying to communicate it for some reason has a fear or is holding it back because they struggle with trusting people. I'm, I'm, I'm scared I'm going to hurt you. I'm scared I'm going to cause this. I'm scared of this. So instead of asking for what they want in the relationship or need in the relationship, they just go, I'll, I'll forget it. I'll just deal with it. And then that creates constant hurt or a constant unmet expectation. Now, the other side of it could be, and this is the part you have to look at, if, am I the one not able to express it, or am I the one creating an environment where my spouse doesn't want to share because I don't respond well, I don't listen? Because you also got to create an environment that goes, no, I want to hear that. I want you to trust me. I want you to be heard. And so you've got to look at those things and go, okay, what is our environment? Are we able to express the needs in our relationship? Another question to ask in your marriage to your spouse is to go, hey, can you express what you need in our relationship? That's a very important question to answer. And one that you just need to sit back and listen if you're going to ask it. To know what environment are you creating. Now, the other one is you don't fight well. I think conflict is part of a healthy relationship because I think that's what creates growth. Uh, there's even moments you think about your relationship with God. There's going to be times you disagree with him. You're like, well, God, why did you allow this? Why didn't you do something? Why? And you get mad. You get frustrated. But God, once again, can step in there and you and God work through it together of going, hey, all right, I'm just, I'm just going to need to trust you. And God's leaning in like, hey, I know you don't get this. I don't, you don't understand this. But trust me, we'll work through this together. We'll walk through this together. And that's what fights should do. It should push us to growth. It should push us to be able to go, okay, like, we're getting better. Conflicts are being resolved. We're looking at healthier dynamics, and it reveals some things about yourself. Like, oh, man, I, I need to get better at this area. I, I know for uh, Tina and I, I, uh, I had some issues I had to work through because, and, and most of this really is, a lot of our ability to fight, we learn from our families. So if your family's dysfunctional, <laughs> you can kind of put two and two together. Now you may go, no, 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 no. I'm better than that. Okay, but you're still probably going to learn some bad habits. Now, I wouldn't say my family was dysfunctional, but one of the things I never saw, and I'm not saying my parents did this wrong or anything, I just never saw my parents fight. So I was just like, I think I call, saw my mom like cry once, and I was like, something's off. Now, I may have been oblivious as a guy. I just may was like, I don't know. I know. That could have happened. But then I get married, and Tina and I, Tina's my wife, we have our first fight, and I'm like, shoot, I guess we're getting divorced. I don't know how this, <laughs> I, I didn't know, we, how do we do this? I, and I'm freaking out, because I'm like, ah, how do I make this better, and all those kind of things. And so sometimes if you don't know how to fight well, well, then these other areas get affected. Well, I can't express what I need because that may hurt you and I don't want to fight. Once again, emotional health starts to fall apart. So learning how to fight well, learning to be able to go, and I'm not saying the fights are just going to be like start off great. Like, oh man, I really love fighting with you. It's not that. <laughs> but able to go through the conflict and go, you know what? 
I'm very thankful we worked through that together. Thank you for pushing me to change. I needed that. That's where you know the conflict's resol resolving itself, and you're, you almost have a story to tell of how you've changed. That's when you're fighting well. And then the last one is simply this. We don't listen. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed is doing a lot of counseling. I do this exercise where I have people kind of express, here's something I want in the relationship. Every time, happens with every couple. I say, okay, here's what listening is. You've got to express the content, and you've got to express the feeling. First usually is, oh, okay, here, here's how we can fix that, is their comment back to the person. Or, yeah, I agree with that. Do you see how dangerous? You've turned the conversation now instead of listening to them. It's about what you think of the conversation. How you want to fix it for them? Or you're assessing whether you agree with what they're talking about. Now, some of that, I understand there's a time for that. But when you're first listening, you need to express, what did they say? Did you hear the content? Not through your translation, but did you hear them? And then on top of it, did you hear the feeling? Maybe the feeling that's causing the pain or causing whatever's going on, but then also kind of asking enough questions to be like, hey, if we were to change this, what would you feel? That's what listening is. But sometimes we turn it into so quickly of assessing the conversation and whether I can help or change it and realize it's a selfish approach to listening. And that's where I see the emotional part comes happening because then you guys think, let's say you get to a spot like, oh, okay, yeah, I think we, we agree on this. This is what we're going to do. And then you do it and your spouse looks at you, that's not what I wanted. You said, but that's what you said. And the laughter means that's happened in your marriage. You're like, that's, <laughs> you've done it before. I've been there. And that part sometimes feels worse, but that should be an indicator. Ooh, I didn't listen. I didn't listen well enough. I didn't ask the right questions. That's what it means. If we offer this gift of going, I want to be emotionally intimate with you. But sometimes we got to work on us. We're the things holding it back. It's a gift you're able to offer. And the question is, are you offering it? Does your spouse feel it? Sense it? Do they feel valued? All right. That's emotional intimacy, physical intimacy. This one always gets fun. Because <laughs> everyone's like, ooh, okay. Or the other one's like, our pastor's going to talk to us about this? Yes, I am. Here we go. Um, because in this one, I think so, it gets so much focus on the sex part of our relationship. I think it's a lot bigger than that. So you look at a physical intimacy, closeness defined by proximity and touch. This is a beautiful gift, once again, that God gives us. But you think about it, we all need it. Throughout relationships, family, friends, even our marriage, you think about it, even as a young child, how important a hug was from your parents. How important just holding hands sometimes or being able to sit in your dad or mom's lap, that kind of touch was so valuable. This is the physical intimacy we're talking about. Yes, it has the, poor, uh, the beautiful gift that God's given us of sex, but it also has affection with it. Loving each other and showing that in a lot of different ways. Now, some of you will be on different levels on this. If your love language is touch, whoever... Um, you marry, they're going to have to learn, like, oh, yeah, you really like that. Okay. Um, I, I have a daughter. Her name's Avery. She is our touch one right now because she will sit right here. And I'll be like, hey, like, there, there's like, the whole couch. Like, <laughs> scoot. And she's like, but, Daddy, why? <laughs> I love being right next to you. I'm like, mm. Me too. Um, and then I give it a few minutes, and I'm like, okay, you're hot. I'm like, get off. <laughs> Move. But recognize, I've got to be careful with that as a dad. If I always push that off, I may be taking a gift from Avery that she needs. And this is the same thing within our marriage, too. We see this. This plays out in a lot of relationships. And so learning how to have the right kind of physical intimacy is important. And catch this. All these intimacies are powerful. This one, when it gets off the tracks, can go down a road you don't want. When physical intimacy is maybe the primary one over all of them, well, you start having unhealthy expectations, you start having unhealthy conversations, because this is driving your marriage and it shouldn't be. 
And so the warning signs, uh, well, first I want to show some scriptures this because I think 1 Corinthians helps us understand this even better. 4 through 5 says this, the wife gives authority over to her body and to her husband, and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourself more completely to prayer. Afterward, you should come together so that Satan wouldn't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I think it's crazy that God, this is in the Bible, and it's very, I think, important for us to understand. God goes, I designed this for physical intimacy, especially in marriage. There's certain parameters that go, this should be in marriage. And we should be careful to uh, not deprive it from each other. We should also be intentional of going, let's make sure it stays in that. Because when it gets outside of that, it gets messy and we hurt each other. Truth is, you know, sometimes we treat sex like it's not that big of a deal. But I haven't met anybody who's like, you know what, sex hasn't hurt me. It has. It hurt a lot of us. And I think God's going, that's why I had to put these parameters around it. That's why I wanted uh, marriage here, this setting, these rules. Because I knew how powerful it was. So warning signs. Lack of affection. To where if you're not able to kind of create that environment that's not just about sex, but more about, hey, I care about you, I love you, I want you to feel that I'm close to you. I would, if you want to put this one, physical intimacy about touch and making sure that that person feels touched in a way that you're like, hey, I want you to know I care about you. And so you've got to ask your spouse, and sometimes this is a tough question to ask, but asking and going like, hey, um, is our affection in the right place? Do you feel that? And so some of the question maybe is like, and what's our level? Do you want like middle school PDA or? <laughs> There's just those dynamics you've got to work through and talk through. And I think most couples don't talk about it enough. It's like this awkward conversation, but yet it's one of the most vulnerable things about us. It's like we want it, but it's hard to ask for sometimes but it's important to have these conversations. Second one is unrealistic expectations. This is a struggle I had, and I wish I would have um, dealt with it earlier, before I got married, is our expectations come from the world. I know for me, um, I wish I would have heard more of what, what are healthy expectations when it comes to physical intimacy? Because I heard it from movies, Hollywood, the internet, <laughs> my high school friends, don't know if they're the best resource, <laughs> you know, like, it was those kind of things. And so that set up expectations that I could sense it. As soon as uh, Tina and I get married, I almost could sense a pressure that I had put on her. I'm like, oh, he's got high expectations in this. Hopefully I can live up to him. And I wish I would have done it differently. Because once again, that creates physical intimacy in a way that just, it's not starting off on the healthiest foot. And so for some of us, we've got to look through this and go, okay, do I even have healthy expectations? And that's a conversation maybe to be had with someone you trust, a godly person who's maybe got a little bit more experience in you and go, what are healthy expectations in this area? Someone who's navigated it before and worked through it. And so I'd encourage you, don't wait, like in all these areas, don't wait two and a half years to six years to get help in this. Start earlier when you start having those questions initially. And then last one, avoiding physical intimacy. Experts say, um, so this is not Todd Lynch saying this, uh, experts say one time a week of having sex is healthy. Now, I've talked to some couples, it's months, it's years that go by. I think that becomes dangerous. I understand, as scriptures say, there might be a season, there might be a time, but you both have got to agree upon that. But if you're avo avoiding physical intimacy, hey, that's a conversation you need to start navigating. There's something there. There's something that's not uh, necessarily correct because I would say emotional intimacy is healthy, spiritual intimacy is healthy, then you'll want to have physical intimacy. It's a desire I think God's given us. It's a healthy desire if we keep it in the rules that God's given us. So there's physical intimacy. Now we've got spiritual intimacy. So you've got... Emotional, that I think we talk about a lot. Physical, we don't talk about enough. And spiritual one, we just don't talk about it at all because we don't know how to talk about it. So here's spiritual intimacy. This is a closeness defined by God leading your personal life and your marriage. This one is the foundation to the other two. 
Because here's the danger if we only focus on emotional and physical intimacy. It is all about you two. It's actually very selfish. It's a focus that's just going, how do we emotionally get better? How do physically we get better? What spiritual intimacy does, it puts you on a bigger mission. It gives you purpose to where your marriage now is not just about you two having this incredible relationship, which is part of it. God wants that for you. But he also goes, I want you to be a part of the mission of showing people who Jesus is. Be a part of the kingdom. Let's go do work together. Those things start to create the emotional intimacy that's healthy, the physical intimacy that's healthy. The spiritual intimacy has got to drive us because it's about who God wants us to be. And helping each other go, I want you to be a better Christian. I want you to be a better Christian. And being the encouragement, but also the accountability for your spouse. But once again, it's like, okay, well, how do we talk about it? How do we do it? And typically we go like, well, I, I know the pastor says, read your Bible, pray, and go to church. And those things are part of it. Don't get me wrong. But I think some of us have done that before, and you go, but it didn't do anything. I mean, some of us have done that even with our relationship with God. I've read the Bible. I was more confused after I got done. You know, I, I prayed, but it just didn't. Or I went to church, and I left the same. So how do you have a spiritual intimacy that actually is growing, actually becoming what you want it to be? Well, I think some of it is learning how to have better conversations about it. Two questions that I want you to start asking within spiritual intimacy. You can ask this of, your spell, of yourself, too, but I also asking your spouse. Be like, okay, what, what is something that you're learning about God? And share it. What is God teaching you? What is he showing you? Just about himself. And then what is one thing that God's pushing you to do? Challenge you. Maybe he's teaching you about yourself. So what is something you're learning about God and what is something God's teaching about you? Those are the two questions that may start to create bigger conversations, bigger dynamics, because that's what God wants. I mean, you can look at this in Ephesians. It talks about this in chapter 5. Look at just the picture that he gives. As Scripture says, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So he points this out. He's like, hey, Marriages should look like the relationship between Jesus and the church. And Jesus had his mission. The church had his mission to where we were supposed to be the light to the world. Jesus saved the world. They both were on mission together. There's purpose behind it. That illustration should go, okay, husband and wife, you are on mission together. Just because you got married, God did not stop with your dreams and your goals. He's going, keep pursuing that. If anything, your spouse should be encouraging those things. That's what spiritual intimacy should create. And a connection that goes beyond just you two, but it's powerful to be able to have it together. So here are the warning signs for spiritual intimacy. Not sharing your dreams, goals, and growth from God to your spouse. Challenging question, when's the last time you actually did this with your spouse? I know for me it's easy for Tina and I just to have the conversation of like, hey, how was your day? Good. How was your day? Great. And we talk about maybe a little bit more. But learning to have these conversations, no, no, no. What are your dreams? What are your goals? What is God showing you? That's the important part. But then the second one on there, because being able to share your dreams, goals, and growth, it's not going to happen if you have a lack of depth or growth in your relationship with God. If you're not putting in the work, now, hey, reading your Bible, praying, and going to church to where you get, create opportunities to go, I may not fully get it all right now, but I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep working because I want to grow. I want to spiritually grow. I'm putting in the work for that. I also think one of the areas that I see, part of the reason we have a lack of growth is because we're willing to compromise. So take for instance, like financial. Hey, I want, God, I want to do my finances very well, but then you never give anything to him. God's going to be like, well, hold on here. Do I have control of your finances? Do I? You're compromising here. Or, hey, we want to have an honest marriage where we tell everything very honestly, but we keep telling white lies to each other. Or, hey, we want to be pure. We want to be faithful to each other in our marriage. But then we don't follow God's rules of staying pure before marriage, and we have sex. See where we start to compromise, and they may not feel like that big a deal. It's just, uh, it's just a small thing. I remember thinking that when we were engaged. Like, what's the big deal? But these compromises, 
take away a gift that God wants to give you, and that's the spiritual intimacy where you're able to offer it to each other, encouraging each other, holding each other accountable. It's hard to be even a leader for Tina if I'm the willing person going, let's compromise on what God wants. See where the intimacy starts to break down. So in this area, I would encourage you, make sure that you're paying attention to these, and the last one is not serving together in some capacity. I think spiritual intimacy speaks to one of the best ways to build relationships is be on mission together, to serve together. So you got a lot of opportunities. You can serve here at the church. Maybe it's something in your neighborhood. You go, hey, we want to get to know our neighbors. Let's put something on once a month. Whatever it may be, but you and your spouse have got to find ways to serve together. Now, may there be seasons where you're serving apart? Sure. But you have to have seasons where you're serving together and going, we got to accomplish this together. This marriage is bigger than just us. So there was, uh, as I was working through it, there was a picture that came up, and it just stuck with me because I'm going, how can I help people understand just, just to visualize what marriage can look like? And what came to mind, how many of you have ever heard of a Tough mutter? Yeah. How many of you have done one? You all are nuts. Um, <laughs> These obstacles that are just crazy, it's, it's events that are done around the whole world, and the whole goal with this organization is that um, they would put on these events that it's, hey, doing this teamwork together, having an amazing moment together, but accomplishing the impossible together. Just heard that, and I was like, man, that's, that's awesome. It's a beautiful thing. And it, when you do it, uh, being able to kind of do these events and the obstacles that you thought, ah, this seems impossible, but doing together as a team... It's crazy. There's one story that stood out to me because there was an 83-year-old lady named Mildred. 83! She's done three of them. She started at 81, if you were wondering. It's not like she started way back, you know. I'm 36 and my back hurts, and so I'm kind of (laughs) like, how do I do this, you know? But part of the reason she started doing this is her son encouraged her to come because she was dealing with grief because her husband had passed away. And this was one of those obstacles she took on and was like, I need to do this. I need to push myself. I need to, and it actually provided healing for her. What I see in that, and in that story, is a beautiful picture of what marriage should be. Where we go through life tackling these big obstacles together. Finances. Kids. But also emotional intimacy, physical intimacy, and spiritual intimacy. And some days we're going to look at each other and go, I don't know if I can do this. This is not what I signed up for. But to have someone there in flesh going, we got this. Let's go do this together. And then to experience accomplishing some of those things, you look back and go, it's incredible. I know for me, one of the best moments um, that I think about on a constant basis is just going, I'm running this race towards Christ and he's encouraging me. He's there. But then there's Tina helping me, encouraging me when I slip up, but also holding me accountable when I start going down the wrong path, which happens way too much than I'd like to admit. But having a teammate and, and me being able to be that for her, to me it's a beautiful picture of what marriage can be, where we're on mission together, And we're spiritually intimate, we're physically intimate, we're emotionally intimate. And God goes, that's the gift I wanted it to be for you. So with the question I started with, what do I do with my marriage? I want to finish with this last scripture. So remember John chapter 17, verse 3, we said this kind of helped define intimacy. What I love is the next verse that helps us go, so how do we do it? Jesus gave us the example. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. God's given you the role. For some of you who have made this decision to be a spouse. It's an awesome opportunity. Comes with a lot of obstacles to overcome and ultimately learning how to love somebody else. But the decision you have to make is, am I, am I willing to put in the work? so that God gets the glory, and one day when I'm in heaven, going, God, thank you for letting me be married to this person. Love the opportunity to serve them because they really helped me. That's when marriage is at its, at its best. And when marriages get healthy in that realm, here's what I know. Marriages get healthier, families get healthier, 
a lot of people get healthier because we don't have the wounds that so many of us are carrying around with us. Now, I know some of you in here, you may go, man, that's what I want. I've been trying to do it myself, but my spouse won't join me, won't do any of this, it's, uh, whatever the case may be. I hear that, and I'm sorry. But the one thing you can do in these moments is go, God, help me to do the work that I must do. I can't control the other person, but I can still choose to love. I can still choose to do what you've asked me in bringing the emotional intimacy, the physical intimacy, and the spiritual intimacy. My hope and prayer is that for all the marriages represented, that we would take this on and do the work that God calls us so that we can be the light, be the change, and create healthiness in so many areas. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for giving us this gift of marriage. God, I pray that you would be with us. I pray that you would guide us. And God, I lift up all the couples to you. God, they, may they experience um, maybe something today where they feel convicted. Maybe there's an area they need to work on, and so God, I pray that they would do that. I pray that they would ask better questions um, and go after these intimacies in an incredible way. But God, thank you for the gift. We don't deserve it. And help us all. Wherever we're at in the stage of life, may we find that these things play out in all stages to where we have an intimate relationship with you. We learn to have an intimate relationship with family and friends, but also especially in marriage. God, we love you. We thank you for everything that you're doing. We pray this in your name. Amen.